This program is brought to you by Link TV for educational and non-commercial use only. Mosaic, a daily news program from Link TV, presents a selection of news reports from independent and state-controlled broadcasters from throughout the Middle East. The Israeli army resumed its military operations in the occupied Palestinian territories. Last night, Israeli planes bombed two homes in Beit Hanun in northern Gaza. The Palestinians held a funeral procession for the three martyrs who were killed in an Israeli airstrike. These events coincided with the opening of the departure area of Rafah crossing for several hours after 47 days of closure. After more than a month and a half of closure, the Israeli authorities reopened the Rafah crossing only for departures. Thousands of Palestinians were crowded outside these gates, hoping to leave the Gaza Strip. Everyone is burdened by illness or worries. We have been suffering because we've been stuck here for a month and a half. We may lose our residency status abroad. We came to the Rafa crossing, but we do not know if we'll be able to enter or not. There are many people here, and you can see what kind of treatment we get. Some women are falling down, others are getting dizzy, others are dying. I just saw a woman who is dying. Instead of letting her enter, an ambulance came and took her out. The Rafah crossing is the only exit that the residents of the Gaza Strip have to the world. Israel has used it as a means to put pressure on the Palestinians. Israel has balked on its promise to open the Rafah crossing five times. Now it's opened it only for departures. So far, there are no guarantees that the crossing will be open for more than a day or that the thousands of Palestinians stuck on the other side of the border would be allowed to return to their homes. 1,000 people. 1,000 people were able to leave, but we do not have guarantees for tomorrow for the more than 7,000 persons in waiting. We are still exerting efforts in order to reopen the crossing tomorrow for both arrivals and departures. The situation of those present here in the Rafa crossing is not different from the situation of most Gaza residents. They are suffering in every aspect of their life due to Israeli practices. Israeli air raids and shelling continued in the Gaza Strip. Israeli planes hit two residential buildings with several missiles after notifying by phone that the residents needed to evacuate the buildings. Hundreds of citizens participated in the funeral procession of the three martyrs who were killed yesterday when Israeli soldiers raided a training center of the Nasser Salah al-Din Brigade. Two of its members and a three-year-old child were martyred. Haida Akila al-Jazeera Rafa, south of the Gaza Strip. During an incursion in Ramallah by the Israeli occupation forces, two Palestinians were killed by gunshots. Palestinian sources confirmed that the military forces surrounded the building, ordered its residents out, and detained them. The area also witnessed armed clashes and confrontations between young Palestinian men and the occupation forces. The war front in Lebanon did not slow the ongoing Israeli military operation on the Palestinian side. This is how West Bank residents live. Their towns are subjected to nightly incursions and non-stop arrests. The list of wanted Palestinians seems to have no end. The following scenario is repeated on a daily basis. Military forces raid a town, like what happened in Ramallah, surround one of the buildings, order its residents out, and detain them until the military operation is complete. At 3 a.m., the soldiers used loudspeakers to order all the residents to evacuate the building, including women and children. All the homes were supposed to stay unlocked. We were not allowed to close them. While wanted Palestinians fortify themselves inside this building, Israeli soldiers brought their families out in an attempt to pressure the wanted to turn themselves in. 
The Israeli army brought the wife of the wanted Palestinian, Hamza Abed, one of Al-Aqsa Brigade's leaders. My husband is an officer in the Palestinian Authority. All the things he did were according to instructions of Palestinian National Authority and its leadership. During the ceasefire, he was committed to it, but Israel was not committed. The area witnessed sporadic clashes before the Israeli army was able to raid the building and detained Ramzi along with Iyad al thukh who was also wanted. The continued arrests brought back the issue of the wanted Palestinians. The Palestinian Authority had promised to employ them in its agencies, but it has not been able to provide them with protection yet. This is happening at a time when the list of detained Palestinians in occupation prisons continues to grow, reaching almost 10,000. Without a glimmer of hope, thousands of Palestinian prisoners are waiting for a prisoner swap so they can be freed. But it seems that the prison gates are only opened to bring in more Palestinians. At the political level, there are only contradictory announcements and nerve-wracking news. Shirin Abu Aqra, Al Jazeera, occupied Ramallah. Ramallah al The Islamic resistance faced intense confrontations with the occupation soldiers in the southern Lebanese villages, where the invading troops incurred many losses. The resistance released several reports announcing that it destroyed 14 enemy tanks since early this morning in Al Qayyum, Marjeun, and Anyat. Meanwhile, TV reports said that eight Israeli soldiers were wounded in the confrontations. Another resistance report said its fighters turned the tanks of the enemy in Sal al Qayyam to mobile coffins after they fired anti-tank missiles from several locations at the Zionist invading forces. Seven Merkava tanks were destroyed, killing and wounding many soldiers. Sources indicate that a large number of tanks retreated to a settlement in Qayyam, which had been hit with more than 1,000 Batusha shells. The resistance also announced that its fighters attacked the enemy's tanks this morning in Al Sidar area in Anyat, destroying three Merkava tanks and killing and wounding many soldiers. While Israel claimed it had taken control of Marjayun, inside information said that the intense clashes in which the resistance fighters used anti tank missiles against the invading troops led to the retreat of the occupation tanks. In another report, the resistance announced that an Israeli unit attempted to advance on the towns of Kantara, Achi, and Lixair, but the resistance fighters attacked it, causing extensive damage. An Israeli spokesperson confirmed last night that 15 soldiers were killed and 40 others were wounded in the clashes that took place with the resistance fighters. This was the strongest blow to the occupation army since the beginning of its assault a month ago. The fallen soldiers were either killed or wounded in clashes in more than one area, especially in the town of Debel, where 11 soldiers were killed after they were drawn into a house that was then blown up with them inside. Other soldiers were killed and wounded in clashes in Ayat al-Shab. The emergency rooms at the Rambam hospital were filled with wounded soldiers and the bodies of those killed. Troops took up positions around 3.30 this morning inside Marjayun and Al Ayam, two Lebanese villages said to be Hezbollah's strongholds in the eastern sector of Lebanon, north of Matula. Hezbollah fired anti-tank missiles towards IDF forces who returned fire. The battles are in an area overlooking a valley where many Katyushas are being fired at Israel. In a raid on a building in the southern Lebanese village of Masal Jabal, IDF troops found aerial photographs of Kiryat Shmona and sophisticated night vision equipment. 
The building served as Hezbollah's command headquarters in the village, and IDF troops killed six gunmen before capturing it. Air Force jets attacked a number of targets in Balabek and the Lebanon Valley, including a road linking the city, traditionally a Hezbollah stronghold, with Syria. Air Force warplanes also dropped leaflets over northern Lebanon today for the first time. The leaflets fell north of Tripoli, Lebanon's second largest city, 25 kilometers from the Syrian border, warning trucks to be off the roads after 8 p.m. The document said trucks were being used to carry rockets and missiles to Hezbollah. Israeli missiles also hit a historic lighthouse in densely populated West Beirut, blowing off part of the roof of the French colonial-era tower. Today's clashes in Lebanon follow yesterday's decision by the government to extend the war up to the Litani River. A senior minister said the expansion of operations in Lebanon is being delayed for two to three days under diplomatic pressure from the United States to allow for the possibility of deploying an international force. Vice Premier Shimon Peres, who abstained from yesterday's cabinet vote, said that Israel has a window of opportunity that allows for a possible diplomatic solution. He says that Israel decided to continue and extend the fighting, but coordinate it with the political conditions. I think that's a fair resolution. Meanwhile, IDF officials say that members of Iran's a Revolutionary Guard were among the terrorists killed in southern Lebanon last week. Ellie Wogelanter, IBA News. Yesterday was one of the um, one of the bloodiest uh, day that we had in terms of uh, casualties. We lost 15 soldiers yesterday, uh, nine of which uh, were in a in a compound that were hit by uh, an attack of missiles, anti-tank missiles. Another four were in a tank that was again. Uh, uh, hit by, by an advanced uh, anti-tank missile. Yes, this is a very expensive uh, war from our point of view, and we lose uh, very brave and determined uh, warriors. But they're not deterred, and they are willing to go in and face the Hezbollah. And, uh, well, we lost, but we killed yesterday roughly 50 of them. And this is a type of army, it's a different type of warfare. It's a type of army that has no warplanes, tanks, or uh, warships. And actually, if you talk about the missiles area, you have no front line. It's coming from wherever. It's a supply chain that is coming from the outside inside and the inside to the villages, uh, and from the villages to the uh, launchers uh, that are in the vicinity of the villages, or sometimes in the villages itself. And this is a different type of warfare that we're fighting. And uh, as far as the uh, uh, ground operation is, uh, of course, this is much of a guerrilla characteristics warfare. And it's uh, in their own landscape. It's a very difficult landscape to fight in. We know that. We've been there many years. And this, this is a difficult war for us. But. We believe that our soldiers are much better, and uh, so far we've killed close to 450 to 500 uh, Hezbollah people. They wouldn't tell you. We have names for over 250, uh, 40 names. They wouldn't tell you anything about their casualties. This is their way, but we know. So we feel that uh, on the uh, objectives, uh, we are quite uh, on track of uh, significantly eroding the Hezbollah capability. The Secretary General for Hezbollah, Hassan Nasrallah, described his party's approval of the deployment of the Lebanese army in southern Lebanon as a great Lebanese commitment to secure a noble political exit from the current impasse. It may help modify the U.S. French draft resolution regarding the war on Lebanon. In a televised speech by Hezbollah Al Manar channel, Nasrallah said that he has previously rejected the deployment of the Lebanese army along the border because he was concerned for its safety and not because he was threatened by it. I would like to clarify our position on the deployment of the Lebanese army along the borders. Yes, we have previously opposed army deployment along the Lebanese borders because we were concerned about the safety of the army and not for the lack of trust. God forbid. The Lebanese army is patriotic and we always praise its dedication and its national leadership. 
In many occasions, we have expressed confidence in the Lebanese army and its leadership, and we spoke very highly of its performance. The Lebanese army is part of Lebanon, by Lebanon, and for Lebanon. There is no difference between the Lebanese army and the Lebanese people. The Lebanese have shown a great deal of resiliency, loyalty, and pride. In the past, we had reservations about the deployments of the Lebanese army along the international borders because we were concerned about its security and safety. Having said that, we were not in any case threatened by the deployment process. It is ludicrous to say that we were threatened by the deployment of the Lebanese army along the borders. Will anyone be threatened by his own army? The fact of the matter we were concerned for the safety of this great army once deployed along international borders. It is wrong to deploy a regular army along international borders to face a ready combatant enemy that may strike at any time. It is like putting the army in the dragon's mouth, a regular army that does not have artilleries, tanks, or air force capabilities may get destroyed within days if it comes under attack. In his speech, Nasrallah also vowed to turn South Lebanon into a graveyard for the Israeli invading troops, confirming that the Israeli attacks had not weakened Hezbollah's rocket capabilities. The Secretary General for Hezbollah called an Arab residence of Haifa to leave town, so they avoid being hurt by Hezbollah's rocket fire. I tell the Zionists that they can come anywhere, invade any place, land their airborne troops at any town or village, but you will suffer heavy casualties. You will not be able to stay on our land. If you invade our country, we will forcefully drive you out. We will turn South Lebanon into a graveyard for the Zionist invading troops. Our brave fighters are still fighting on the front lines. In every Lebanese town, village, hill and valley, there are thousands of brave mujahideen or freedom fighters who are anxiously waiting to fight the Israeli troops. Those mujahideen want to follow on the footstep of their brothers who are already fighting on the ground and on the front lines. We want all forms of Israeli aggression to end. That is what we want and wish for. However, if fighting is deemed necessary, I tell the Israelis, welcome to a showdown in the battlefield. The Lebanese Red Cross was compelled to transport four Lebanese war victims by foot. They carried them on stretchers across the Litany River. The main bridge that connects the cities of Sidon and Tyre has been recently shelled by Israeli warplanes. Al Arabia correspondents accompanied the Lebanese emergency crew who transported the four Lebanese victims by foot from the Jabal Amel Hospital in Tyre to a hospital in Beirut. The Lebanese Red Cross had no choice but to transport many war victims by foot. The victims were carried on stretchers across the Latani River. They were transported by foot from the Jabal Amal Hospital in Tyre to hospitals in Sidon and Beirut. Health services at hospitals in Tyre have deteriorated significantly due to the war on Lebanon. The city of Tyre was isolated due to the bombardment of roadways and bridges leading to and from the city. It is the first time in 10 years that we have to transport victims by foot via the Litani River. Emergency crew rolled their sleeves up and got in the water to help carry the victims from one side to the other. Some victims badly needed to be transported from Tyre to local hospitals in Sidon or Beirut. Emergency crew in Tyre escorted the victims by foot to the Litani River and then carried them on stretchers across the river to an ambulance on the other side, where they will be taken to hospitals in Sidon or Beirut. I hope that the world can see these tragic images over their television screens. This is not the first time the Red Cross defied the challenges and the security situation in Lebanon, but it was the first time that it had transported victims by foot through a river. This is the first time in my life that I helped to transport victims through a river. 
it is very unusual to do this. This can get very dangerous because of strong currents and all the mud and rocks in the river. The Lebanese Red Cross in Tyre had rescued more than 300 victims since the start of the Israeli attack on Lebanon. It is the only relief agency that travels and moves around in southern Lebanon despite the alarming security situation. Since the start of the Israeli attack on Lebanon, the Lebanese Red Cross and the Lebanese Civil Defense Agency have deployed emergency crews in southern Lebanon. With no security guarantees, emergency crews of the Red Cross have traveled from one area to another to help war victims. Walel Assam Al Arabia. Walel Assam Al Arabia. Killing people in Iraq is like smashing an ant. These were the words of the main defendant who was accused of raping an Iraqi girl and killing her in South Baghdad. According to the Washington Post's correspondent, Andre Feldman, who met with the defendant prior to the incident. The following report sheds light on the case of the Mahmoud Adia female martyr and how the Americans are treating our people. Washington Post correspondent Andre Feldman said that the American soldier Stephen Green, the main defendant in the rape of a 15-year-old Iraqi girl in southern Baghdad, had told him that killing people in Iraq is like smashing an ant. A month before the rape incident, which took place in March 2006 in Mahmoudia. Describing the situation in Mahmoudia, Green also told the Washington correspondent, killing is a normal thing here. One kills a person in Iraq and later says, let's get some pizza. Without showing any emotions, Green said, I shot a person who refused to stop at a checkpoint. It felt as if nothing had happened. Of course, I used to think that killing a person changes everything, but after I did the killing, I realized it's a normal thing. The 21-year-old soldier Stephen Green is accused of raping a young Iraqi woman and then killing her along with three of her family members, including her five-year-old sister in al Mahmudeya, 30 kilometers south of Baghdad. The Washington Post correspondent Andre Feldman met with Green when he was serving in Infantry Division 502 one month before this incident. According to the Washington Post, the conversations that the correspondent had with Green prior to the incident are chilling. Green had told the correspondent, I'm here for one year and I can't do anything about it. All I want is to stay alive until I come back. I don't care about Iraq and I don't care anyway. He added that this war is different from the wars that his fathers and grandfathers lived through. These wars, he said, were fought for something, but this war is for nothing. The U.S. Department of Justice announced it had detained the former soldier Stephen Green, who is suspected of participating in the rape that took place in March in Mahmoudia in southern Baghdad. The accusations were made against him in the beginning of June in North Carolina. Green was indicted by a federal judge. Green and three other individuals went to a home in al Mahmoudia where he allegedly killed a young girl after raping her in addition to killing her parents and sister. The Washington Post reported that the young girl, who is the center of an investigation conducted by the American army in Iraq, had complained that the soldiers were harassing her before she was killed along with her other family members in March. The mayor of Mahmoudia and another official from the Mahmoudia hospital told the Washington Post the names of the rape victim, her parents, and her seven-year-old sister. The paper did not confirm that the Americans were the ones who killed the 15-year-old girl, whose name is Abir Qasim Hamza. However, local residents told the Washington Post that they believe that the American soldiers are being investigated for the killing of the family of the girl. American officials revealed that they have two suspects in custody believed to be involved in the rape incident, including a soldier who was discharged. He is also suspected of being involved in another murder. 
One of the family neighbors, Omar al Ganadi, told the Washington Post that Abir's mother had told him on March 10th that her daughter had complained many times because the American soldiers were harassing her at a nearby checkpoint. al Ganadi added that he was the first to arrive at the home of the family after the assault. He said that he found Abir dead in a corner of her home and that her hair was burned. He also saw a pillow near her and that her dress was lifted up all the way to her neck. The paper reported that according to the death certificate that was produced by the Mahmoudiyah Hospital, the victims were Abir Qasim Hamza, who was killed by gunshot wounds to the head. Her 34-year-old mother, Fakhreya Taha Mohsen, was killed by several gunshot wounds to the head. The 45-year-old father, Qasim Hamza Rahim, sustained severe injuries to the head. The seven-year-old sister, Hadir Qasim Hamza, was also killed. The investigation began after two soldiers from Infantry Division 502 turned their colleagues in. American Army officers said that the Army has this crime on record, but attributed it to the armed groups that are fighting in Iraq. Local residents and officials who live in one of the most dangerous and violent areas have given contradictory testimonies about different events involving the American soldiers. This rape crime, which comes two years after the Abu Ghraib prison scandal and after a series of murder accusations that were made against American soldiers, including the killing of 24 persons in Haditha, south of Iraq, may generate a volcano of anger, especially considering that it happened in a conservative Muslim society like the one in Iraq. Al-Zawra Satellite Channel, Rashwa Saad. A suicide bomber killed at least 35 people, including two Iwani pilgrims, and wounded more than 120 on Thursday near the shrine of Imam Ali, the first Shiite imam in the southern city of Najaf in Iraq. Nine Iranians were also among the wounded. The bomber blew himself up at a police checkpoint on his way to the shrine. TV pictures showed the body of a child being laid beside other bloodied courses on a patch of ground by a hospital. The dead marked with numbered white labels on their foreheads included both police and civilians. An Iraqi insurgent group said it was behind a bombing. It was the bloodiest attack since July 18th when 59 people were killed by a suicide bomb in Kufa near Najaf. Meanwhile, Iranian Foreign Ministry spokesman Hamid Reza Sefi strongly condemned the attacks, saying terrorists carry out the bombing to undermine the spirit of Muslims on one hand and weaken the national solidarity in Iraq on the other. Asafi noted the end of Iraq's occupation holds the key to establish security in the war shattered country. Hezbollah members firing anti tank rockets and mortar bombs hit at least 14 Israeli tanks near the town of Marjaun on Thursday during fierce fighting in the area after a major Israeli incursion. Hezbollah rockets and mortars rained down on the Zionist forces between Marjayun and Khayyam, killing or wounding at least 50 Zionists in the fighting. Israeli planes and artillery pounded Khayyam as the fighting raged on, while Zionist troops were forced to withdraw from the Marjayun after the Hezbollah launched its counter-offensive against Israeli forces trying to advance toward Khayyam in southeast Lebanon. The views expressed on Mosaic are those of the participating broadcasters, not Link TV or its sponsors. Please visit linktv.org backslash mosaic for more information about these broadcasters or to view previous Mosaic programs, obtain program transcripts, or receive the weekly Mosaic Intelligence Report. Mosaic is made possible by a grant from the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation. Additional support is provided by the Firedall Foundation, the Otto Haas Charitable Trust, and by committed Link TV viewers like you. If you value this program, please send your tax deductible contribution to Link TV, either through the website or the mailing address listed on your screen.
This program was brought to you by Link TV for educational and non-commercial use only. Link TV is the only U.S. television network devoted to global and national news with uncompromising documentaries and diverse cultural programs, programs which connect you to the world.